watching Roadshow powered by CNET and arguably autonomous cars are the future of driving. There's no bigger proponent of the future of driving than Ford CTO Raj Nair who's joining me right now. Raj, thank you very much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Tim. So uh, a lot of interesting announcements and an interesting cadence. Uh, I was just, just talking with Ron Albert from uh, the Detroit Auto Show about that. We've gone from the CES last week, which is a lot of software and technology announcements. Now we're here in Detroit. Uh, a lot more sheet metal here than there was there. But ultimately, some of those stories are continuing over from one to the other. Uh, Ford Smart Mobility is a big program that you're talking about, you've talked about for the past few years. Uh, and some interesting technology announcements here. One of which was, I think, uniquely Detroit, in that you're talking about driving autonomous cars in the snow, something you probably can't test out in Las Vegas as easily. No, I, I, yeah, we talked about autonomous vehicles out in Las Vegas and um, announced that we're tripling our fleet. Right. Uh, and so having the largest fleet of any automaker autonomous vehicle development fleet. But the snow story does seem to carry in Detroit a little bit better. So uh, we did announce here in Detroit that we're also the first automaker to start testing autonomous vehicles in the snow, which, which has its own challenges, just as it does for a human driver. Right, because basically most autonomous cars are looking at the road, they're looking at signals on the road, lines, and so on and so forth. And once you get a snowstorm, I'm mean, a baby who lives in the north knows those lines pretty quickly disappear. So what the scanners are doing is basically looking at the entire environment, right, to build a 3D map of the world and driving within it. Is that right? Exactly. So what, what they're actually doing is they're looking at the entire world and picking up signposts or other things that are above the snow level, then mm -hmm. comparing it to a previously done high definition map. And so referencing that, the car can tell exactly where it is because it can't see the lines on the road anymore. And that also means that the car can be updating maps as it goes, right? Because now you're scanning everything and it can just be rebuilding maps as it scans along? Yeah, it's kind of a continuous cycle. Uh, you need that high definition map to begin with, but the vehicle itself as it's out there, scanning, comparing where it is, is also able to send the data back and mm -hmm. update that map. So the more vehicles you have, the, the more, um, latest up-to-date information you'll have in the high-definition maps. We're seeing some interesting advancements in autonomy coming to the road already. Uh, both Volvo and, and Mercedes-Benz showed off some interesting autonomous functionality that's coming to their cars this year. So a lot of people, I think, are going to be surprised by how quickly that's actually coming to fruition. Um, what's that process going to be like? Is it going to be an uncomfortable transition as we go from cars that we humans all have to drive to cars that can all, one way or another, drive themselves? Yeah, I think the term autonomous driving is, is, is covering a broad spectrum right mm -hmm. now. Um, we kind of view it more maybe perhaps on an engineering viewpoint, uh, particularly Society of Automotive Engineers, five levels of autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, and what we would say is levels one, two, three, which is a lot of the driver assist technologies you're yeah, referring things to, we're starting to see. Uh, are really semi-autonomous driving. Sure. That at points in time, the vehicle definitely needs to hand back over to the human driver. Mm -hmm. What we would say level four is what you could qualifies full autonomy in that our definition of, of level four in a geofenced area that would have the high definition map that we just talked about. Right. And at least right now with, with the technology capability, climate conditions that are suitable for the sensors to be able to see. Um, within those two caveats, full autonomous, i.e. get in your vehicle, mm -hmm. never touch the controls, get to your destination, get out of the vehicle, that entire journey being fully autonomous. And that's what we would define as fully autonomous. Now, we think we'll see a lot of uh, progress in driver assist technologies and semi-autonomous, but it's almost a different technical solution if you start out with, I want to deliver level four autonomy. Right. Um, and part of that is, is the technical side. Part of it is also the human machine interface. As you get to these really high percentages of autonomy, but you still need to hand over, mm. human nature is it's difficult to hand over because at those high percentages, the human psychologies, they're just not necessarily paying attention and right. don't have the situational awareness. And so that, that becomes a, a challenge to make sure that the driver's ready to take over in those instances. And so it, it, is the challenge there detecting the awareness of the driver or making sure that, or basically preserving the awareness of the driver, as it were? It's a little bit more preserving the awareness of the driver. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've seen, you know, some of the YouTube videos of, of certain semi-autonomous technologies from that, certain companies, right? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that um, you know drivers aren't necessarily using it the way it was intended, mm -hmm. and 
if the vehicle had to hand over that situation, it'd obviously be a pretty dangerous situation. You'd be in trouble for sure. Now, one of the other big announcements that we, we've seen is the adoption of CarPlay and Android Auto coming to four, Sync 3, but also the extension of, of AppLink and Smart Device Link, basically uh, adding on another partner who happens to be across the hall here, Toyota, basically signing on to make it so that apps that are written against Ford's uh, interfaces can also run in Toyota's future cars, making it easier for developers to target both platforms. Uh, what's the next step for that standard, and will that become an industry standard? Can we expect that kind of thing? Well, we hope so. Um, it's great to have a, a partner like Toyota uh, come on board. We've mm -hmm. got a lot of other manufacturers that have expressed interest, um, and so it's, it's gaining a lot of momentum. And clearly for developers, it's great news. They, they can develop one app and then really serve many brands with that app versus mm -hmm. having to write specific apps for each brand. And it also comes with, um, with Smart Device Link or, or Ford App Link, a lot more vehicle data is available. Uh, it's a limited amount of vehicle data that uh, is available for Android Auto and, mm -hmm. and Apple CarPlay. Still, you know, great systems and yeah. we're happy to give the customer a choice. But in the native Sync 3 system and with apps enabled through AppLink or Smart Device Link for the, the industry, mm -hmm. a lot more of that vehicle data becomes available and makes those apps a lot more useful. So instead of just having an app provide music to your head unit or something like that, the, the app can itself receive data from the car, things like uh, fuel economy, distance speed, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, all of that. E even the GPS signal, which, you know, the, the car has a higher fidelity GPS capability mm -hmm. than just your smartphone does, right? So all of that can be mm -hmm. tied in and, and the car is capable of dead reckoning without a GPS signal all of that tied in even to the, the navigation systems. And do you see this as um, uh, competing against Android Auto and CarPlay? Is this, is this uh, a bit of the, the industry's attempt at con continuing that progress of having the built-in systems be uh, as exceptional as anything? Or ultimately, is it just complementary? Or you know, I guess, what's the future going to be for it? Well, I, I think we want to give our customers choice mm -hmm. in, in whatever system they're comfortable with. Um, but it's also uh, an indication of the capability, the increase in capability yeah. in the automotive environment that an actual automotive manufacturer can do. All right, we talked a lot about software. Let's talk about some more fun stuff. Uh, Raptor, big truck. Uh, t tell me all about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we uh, you know showed the question. latest uh, Raptor uh, earlier this week um, and the Super Crew version of the Raptor, mm -hmm. um, but also showed a little bit more information about it. Uh, you know, it's going to be a 3.5 liter V6 twin turbocharged direct injection engine um, that is served to have a lot of horsepower, a lot of torque. So it, it'll be more horsepower and torque than our current. 6.2 liter V8. Mm -hmm. um, the vehicle's 500 pounds lighter, uh, six inches wider than an F-150, more travel. Uh, we've also uh, expanded our modes capability uh, to the off-road type environment that Raptor drivers love to be in, mm -hmm. including a, a Baja mode and a rock crawling mode. Um, so we think we got a real winner on our hands. The original Raptor was a, a tremendous winner for us. And, right. and now all the advantages we have with the new F-150 and its aluminum construction and, and lightweight, we're transferring over to the Raptor and it takes it to that next level. I was talking with um, Patrick George from Jalopnik yesterday who, who said that the Raptor is one of the most American cars on the market and I would definitely agree with that. But the Super Crew edition is a little bit interesting. Are you, are you going to be out racing with your friends across the desert, do you think? Or is this just for the more practical between the race stages, that kind of thing? Well, the Super Crew certainly makes the vehicle more practical mm -hmm. uh, and the capability of either the Super Cab or the Super Crew are, are pretty close. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's going to be up to the race teams. The vehicle's already out there racing, actually. Uh, it's one of those programs that we actually use racing to help develop the vehicle. And so the, the race experience has proved valuable. And when might we, we see that uh, truck in production? We'll when see that later this year, in production later this year. And we also, you know, for those performance enthusiasts, mm -hmm. introduced uh, an extension to the Fusion family, the Fusion Sport, mm -hmm. and uh, put our 2.7 liter EcoBoost engine into that at 325 horsepower and 350 foot-pounds of torque through an all-wheel drive system. So nice. You know, 50 horsepower, 100 foot-pounds of torque, more than anybody else in the segment. Does it have an SHO bag on uh, a badge on the We're back? We're calling it a Fusion Sport, uh, mm -hmm. and but it's definitely along that you know performance line that our mm -hmm. customers have been asking for in the Fusion. On top of the the breadth of the offering of Fusion is really amazing. Um, whether it's the hybrid or the plug-in hybrid, we're the only one to offer a plug-in hybrid in mm -hmm. that segment and helps support us being the number one plug-in hybrid seller in the country. That's great. So you've got all the powertrain options on the Fusion now. We've got the big, fast truck. And, of course, you've got the Ford GT coming uh, in the very near future, which you must be pretty excited about. Yeah. You know, we've got uh, you know, both the race program and the production program progressing. Mm -hmm. um, got a, a production vehicle right here at the show, but we've also got the race vehicle out in the lobby. And, actually, the, the race vehicle was down at Daytona this, this last weekend testing. And 
you know, we hope to be on track to be ready to race that at an inaugural race at uh, the Rolex 24 at Daytona at the end of the month. And then going internationally uh, this summer? Internationally, first international race will be at Silverstone, mm -hmm. and so we'll have two cars racing here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and two cars racing in Europe. We'll bring both of those teams together at Le Mans. We'll be, hopefully, we'll be invited to to race four cars at Le Mans. That's great. I, I hope to be there, and I'm guessing that you're hoping to be there as well. Yeah, it'll be a, a special <laughs> race. It's you know this yeah. year's the 50th anniversary of when we won. Came in one, two, three in 1966. Classic, GT4, so, classic story. Uh, yeah. We would love to repeat that that victory and celebrate the 50th birthday properly. Absolutely. Now, final question. We've been asking everybody this. What are you driving these days? What am I driving? Yes. Uh, I and please don't of, tell me it's a Ford GT because I'll be incredibly jealous. Uh, not a new Ford GT. I do have a, a 2006 Ford GT that I, oh, nice. I do love to drive. Yeah. I, I have a um, Shelby Mustang GT 350R that I also love to drive. But for the winter, both of those pretty well stay in the garage. Probably and, as uh, should. Uh -huh. I actually have the Mustang, a regular Mustang GT, which um, is still a fantastic vehicle to drive. And that does get me around through most of the winter. Uh, but this morning, I did borrow my wife's Explorer, so, okay. which is a fantastic vehicle to make it here early in the morning Probably on a snowy with, Detroit with snow winter morning. Around here, which has been causing travel heartbreaks for a lot of our colleagues. So, all right, Raj, thank you so much. It's been a great show for Ford. We're glad to have you here on the stage, and thank you again.